Hello to all of you. I'm glad to see you back here. It's uh, good to see you from here and not down there. <laughs> uh, I am Trina Lise Linda. Uh, I have been organizing and making and playing LARP since 1997. And for the last couple of years, I've made several rerunnable LARPs, uh, like Mad About the Boy, Screwing the Crew, and Summer Loving, and a couple others. So this is one of the things I'm kind of into. Uh, what I really want to go through in this uh, this class, if we can say that, is what a rumble large is. We're going to look at that. Uh, and challenges, both when it comes to designing them and to communicating them. And I want some help from you when we come there to find these challenges. I also want to look at solutions for these, obviously. That's what's the whole point. Uh, and then I will just summarize everything in the end. Um, so what is a rerunnable mark? Any suggestions? Is it a mark which you can repeatedly run again and again? It's something you can play several times. Yes. That's true. It's a lark that is possible to run again and again. And the point with this is that it's uh, it's both possible to do this for uh, your own group. So, for instance, if you are an organizing group and you want to make uh, a LARP that maybe has a limited amount of people in it, but you know that there's a bigger audience, so that you want to make four times this LARP so that you can have 40 players, but still only have 10 in each run. Uh, and the good things about this is because you put down quite a lot of effort into making a LARP. It's many, many hours of work. Uh, and the other thing is that you can also have economies of scale in this way. <coughs> that uh, a production might cost a lot of money, and the money that you take in is often from participants' uh, payments. So in order to have more money so that you can cover the full budget, you can run it several times. But there's another thing, and that's uh, when you can, that a rerunnable LARP is something you can run again and again, and it can be run by someone else. So that it's not necessarily you that's running it. One thing is that somebody else in your organizer group can run it, but also someone that has never met you. And this obviously gives some challenges in designing it. Uh, so this is uh, what rerunnable LARPs might be like. I just want to take a little look at what is a non-rerunnable LARP. Since if you might be designing something, it could be a good idea to look at is this rerunnable. Uh, huge productions, like for instance 1942. Uh, it could be run again, mm -hmm. in principle. But the LARP was so big, it had such a lot of funding, it was very clearly uh, placed in Haridla, and it needed a lot of equipment. So, could be possible to run again? It's hard to do it. Uh, another thing is, uh, as I said with also 1942, written for a specific location, written for specific stash equipment. You could also have LARPs that are written for a specific time, like for instance, uh, the Bronze Age LARP in 1995, which required a moon eclipse. You don't have those too often. So it's kind of hard to reproduce when that's a central part of your game. Uh, can, can, you, can I explain the Moon eclipse, it's when, when, the, when the moon, is it when the moon goes in front of the sun? so that you can't see uh, the moon. So it's, it happens sometimes, but it's not very often. Uh, it can be that the characters are created for a specific player, so that you need special abilities in a player. For instance, this guy is a brilliant fiddler, so we can make something for a fiddleman. But then in the next round of the game, you don't have a fiddler. That's a problem. Uh, or specific traits of other players. 
And it's also something that often the, the, play, the characters are created by the players themselves leading up to the LARP, not that, like in the workshops that we've been talking about, but making very much of the content of the LARP in the time before. And this is often done in what we call campaign LARPs, uh, which is, for instance, a fantasy world that keeps going, and you have a new LARP and a new LARP, and part of the point is <coughs> the continuity of it. So it's not interesting to play uh, the same story again. It's interesting to see how it goes on. And this is also that the, the, the players might have very um, strong attachments to the characters. They're their characters, not somebody else's. But then, there are quite a lot of uh, LARPs that were never meant to be rerunable, that have been made rerunable. And that's, for instance, how I started doing rerunable LARPs. Uh, Club Felis is a Swedish LARP uh, made in 2004. It's about a nightclub for cat-like creatures. So you play, uh, play stray cats and, uh, and house cats, and you sip milk drinks, and every week they create Cat of the Year. Um, and I really, really love this game. Uh, I think it was a lot about the, the physicality of it. You got to like crawl around on the floor, uh, you uh, played around with huge balls of yarn, you would cuddle people and get scratched on your stomach, and also the weird cat logic of everything, which was very different from, from other games that I played. So I really, really liked this game. Uh, but the other thing that it introduced me to were workshops. Like the workshop you've been having today, uh, and uh, workshops that you've had before other games this week. I had never experienced that before. But it was such a powerful thing, uh, because you could create everything. My character was very short. I was Schopenhauer. I was a cat living in a student building. Uh, so I got a lot of cuddling, but I also sometimes had to drink from the toilet bowl, because nobody really took any responsibility for me. And that was what I had. And I had a tail. And that was what I had. But then through the workshops, we built everything. And I really, really like this game. So in the first place, I tried to make the Swedish organizer come to Norway to do it. But they didn't want to, they, or they couldn't, or something. But I still really wanted this LARP to go to Norway. I'm quite a missionary. When I find something I really like, I want to spread it to other people. Uh, so in the end, I teamed up with Tuchette Ledlan, and we uh, got all the characters and we translated them into Norwegian. And then we ran it in Norway. And then we told people about this. And then people that were asking, can I run this in the Czech Republic? Someone asked. Uh, and then we wanted to, uh, and then we translated it to English. And in the process, we also made the scenario text t describing how are you going to make this one. Uh, and that was how it started. And then it was played in the Czech Republic. And since we have heard rumors that it's been played in Israel and in New Zealand, uh, but we haven't got proper reports. But that was a LARP that was never meant to be rebundable, but that ended up being it. What we're going to talk about today is LARPs that are meant to be rebundable, that you start with and you design them for that. <clears throat> and then we have some challenges when it comes to designing for rebundability. So what I want you guys to do now is to sit maybe two minutes alone and think about challenges when you are designing a LARP that can be run again by somebody else who's never met you. <coughs> Take two minutes on your own to think about this.
Now I want you to talk to the person next to you about what you have thought of and what they have thought of. interesting scenario to play it again. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, that's a good point. Um, about the money, yes, that's that's uh, something, but that's uh, production. Uh, that's not game design in this context. So we will go on, but uh, the openness and uh, the clear communication is important. What about you guys? Yeah. You, in the in peach sweater. Mm-hmm. 
then sometimes maybe from when you write it, write the whole thing down so that someone else in another country maybe like enter write it. Yeah. It's interesting. And uh, also, a uh, big challenge would be to. Uh, to one, for game, biggest challenge for game master psychological relation to this bar, to let it go as, as a child. Yeah. You're creating it and you know they won't be able to take care of you. My guy. <laughs> no. yeah. oh, but, uh, and also the, the understanding after you work for hours, for days without sleep, and the understanding that after an hour it's not going to be over and you still will have to work. <laughs> uh, it's also, it requires some kind of psychological support or at least some workshop <laughs> for Game yeah. Master, as well as uh, a lot of work after first few runs to troubleshoot, and as well as uh, characters and situations should be the most <laughs> universal possible, so it could be uh, the most adjustable and transferable to uh, variable audience. Mm. So you have flexibility and and also uh, <coughs> evaluation, and troubleshooting, and changing things around. And the game master care about game masters. Yes, care about game masters. What about uh, Hilda or Slav? Yeah, we were two different groups. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hilda, Hilda. Uh, yeah, we were also talking about cultural differences when writing characters, <coughs> uh, and also that. People will interpret it differently with the, the workshops and everything. Mm. So, especially when, like, if you have a hardcore lot, that you, know, you have to be a really good uh, game master to take it over. Yep. Also, Maya? We're talking about language and terminology. Mm -hmm. You could face problems trying to find good substitutes for expressions or actually make it believable in another language. Yeah, and also, uh, like for example, if you write a uh, sort of moody clock style, then you use certain jargon, I guess, and someone from other art culture can maybe read it. Yeah. So it can be hard to communicate clearly what you mean because you have a preconception of a playing style and a LARP style. Yeah. Front row? Maya? Not much dim on it, but I think when you're writing something to be rerunable, especially if you're not supposed to do the reruns yourself, uh, there are so many instructions that you have to put on paper that you don't need. It's okay to have them in your head when you're the main organizer and you're taking care of the LARP, but it's like in what order things are supposed to happen, how the game is actually played, so many things that's easy to communicate verbally, but can be really hard to put on paper. I think. That's maybe. So the challenges, challenges of actually writing a scenario text. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, but uh, most of it has been said already. Yeah. But um, secrets and openness in what the game is about and what happens. Transparency, mm -hmm. because uh, well, basically, if you have a game that will be run again and again, at some point, someone will want to play this, but they know that the secret is the magic stone or whatever. Mm. Yeah. Yes, girl. We were talking about. About the same thing. Be careful about being specific about uh, location and things like that. But just flexibility and stuff out, and uh, maybe keeping it a little bit uh, minimalistic as well. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you have to get all these stars like 1942 and stuff, it's really hard to rerun the whole alarm. So it's very easier to rerun a lot with not so much stuff. Yeah. Are there other things that we haven't covered? Are there groups that are sitting with things that that you feel is important that's not been covered? Aliona? I don't know, maybe it's for some people's ridiculous challenge is perfection. Some people are perfectionists to say, oh no, I can't write it down because I need to make it more and more, and, more and then they never write it so many people run it. Mm. Like that. That's super. Tatiana? I think it's also flexibility of the game. So, for example, if you want to have a set number of players, or if you can do two of them in the character description. Or also, how are you going to make sure that in case of events, luck, uh, leading or something like that, everything is going to happen to the game you see? So mm -hmm. it's all should be included already inside, no matter how bad everything else is going to be. Mm -hmm. So it just takes more from the quality of the luck, I guess, or something like that. Yep. So you need to have that there. And the flexibility of number of players. For example, this, for example, we have said, yes. and it uh, puts back to the character description. So if, for example, you have less than. <coughs> yeah, good. I think I'm getting through. Uh, I, I have put down 
some of these challenges. Um, number of people, like Tatiana said. Uh, there's also gender questions, because you don't know if your players will be the same gender uh, as ones who sign up in the first place. Uh, just to say, gender is, is like sex, but the gender role. Like, how many people do you have of each sex? Uh, or sex. Ah, now I'm really getting into it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's hard because it's the same words in Norwegian, so I can't really... But um, that you have males and females or even other genders. How do you deal with this in the LARP? Uh, and then there's the secrecy versus transparency. It's evaluation, which is this, uh, troubleshooting, as you were talking about as well. To have that, and to build that into the this, this sign. Then there are some things in communication. There are some of these things that are also in the design, but it needs to be communicated. Uh, and that's the LARP style that you were talking about. Uh, here, there, I didn't put in cultural differences. But that's kind of both large culture differences, but also cultural differences between people. But that's up to the, the next um, organizer to figure out how can they change this. Because I'm gathering that if they want to put it up, they have done that. Um, they have done that. Um, they, they thought, okay, it's different from our culture, but I choose to have my players play it still. But it could be problems. And there's some things with time frame that you need to communicate, location, uh, and also unknown methods to the people that are going to make it uh, again. There are probably a lot of more things, but I'm just going to say something about these. So I'm going to try to give you some solutions uh, when it comes to number of players. It's, uh, the need, it needs to be flexible. And how are you going to make it flexible? For one, it's, it's a good thing to, to just design a range. For instance, when you play the Family Anderson, that's a game that can be played with 8 to 11 players. And it's written into the game that you can, you can combine the Alex character and the Robin character, so that they are two, or they are one, and then you can add uh, Sasha, Tintin's assistant, uh, as another role. You can even go up to 12. So it's, it has a range. New Voices in Art that we played the other day can be played with, I guess, from 8 to 40 players. Uh, but if you play it with 8 to 10 players and it's only artists, it's actually a different game from the one we were playing. Because it gets a totally different dynamic when you only have uh, the artists there and a lot less people in the room. Uh, but it has a range of how many you can have to play it. Uh, and then it's the, that you have different solutions. If the characters are pre-written, or if you make them on the spot like we did earlier today in the workshop. So with pre-written characters, you have, uh, it could be a good idea to have a list of priority. What characters do you need to have in your LARP? And what characters can you skip? And if you're going to skip them, how are you going to do it? It's good to have combination possibilities, like in, uh, in Family Anderson. You can also have a duplicate. Uh, like, for instance, in New Voices in Art, several of you got the same uh, statement. So there were several people that had sort of the same thing that they could do again. That was a workshop way of doing it. If you have the pre-written characters, you can also, for instance, Love in the Age of the Basement, which is a game where people have played two and two most of the time. You can just duplicate them. And in other LARPs also, you can also duplicate some characters. Uh, give them a different name, give them maybe just a different occupation, and just the relationships that they will be in, being somewhere else, will change around. But have a plan for this. Uh, what characters can be skipped? What character can be uh, added? And there's a possibility to, you are writing the characters, but the relationships between the characters are not pre-made. You can make that in the LARP. For instance, when I made Screen Crew, which is uh, a game about a group of friends that have known each other for a very long time, and several of them are couples, 
So the characters were maybe this long, just describing the, the dynamics inside a couple. But the relationships were made in the workshop, uh, in the spot with the ball of yarn that uh, like Christophe described earlier today. So you can make the relationships there, even if you have the pre-written characters. And then you have uh, that you can change relationships if you have written them into the characters already. Uh, when Frida and Tira and I made Klassefesten, we discovered at the very end that it was possible to take out groups uh, without too much problem. They, these were groups that had relationships, but uh, but they were uh, they had mostly relationships to each other in a group of four. So when you took out the whole group of four, you only had to mend two or three relationships that would have to be given to someone else. And it could be a, an idea to design modules of people that are they belong to a bigger group, but uh, you can take out the whole smaller group and still the game will work. But to take out these to, to build modules into the design can be a good thing if you have the pre-written characters and you need to take some out. If you don't have pre-written characters, uh, it's more flexible. Then you usually have the methods for creating characters on the spot, as Christopher has taught us a lot about. And the uh, pros of this is that you are more flexible. But there are some problems with it. Like, if you want to, uh, if you want this game to be about something specific, if you want to <coughs> distribute information about different things, like if you take Snap Palma that we played, you might want to have some themes coming in with these characters. So one character is representing something. So one character is representing loyalty to the partisans. One is representing loyalty to the state. Uh, and, and that if you want to have a web where all these different things come in, that's hard to get when you are having a character creation uh, process on the spot. It, or at least it's hard to control that you actually get it. Um, and it can also be that the players will not make things that are... They, they will go kind of on the same things that they usually do. It might also be hard for new players to do this. Uh, and it's less possibility to, to balance your player group. You get more, maybe, um, off-game groups that, that forms, and that off-game, um, hence, uh, I can't speak English today, it's hard. Um, off-game things. Huh? Concerns. Off-game concerns and off-game uh, status can, can kind of go into the game in a way that might not always be good. Uh, but it's a lot more fre flexible, so this is a very good thing. We go to the gender and see some solutions there. Uh, you have that you can write gender neutral characters, like in the family Anderson, where all the characters have gender, gender neutral names. It was the same in Snap Palma, where you had uh, a woman's name and a man's name, so that you could choose based on who's playing it. Uh, and this is good in many ways, but sometimes it's interesting to, to play on gendered issues. So it's, you need a number of, of men, and you need a number of women to play this game, because it's interesting to play on this. So you can have some characters that are gendered, and then you can have some characters where it's not so important. They're playing, they have different things to play on. So they can be gender neutral. And then you have a flexibility in this. Uh, you can also just disregard the player's gender. So that uh, anyone can play any character's gender. Like for instance, Mad About the Boy, that we made a couple of years ago, where all the characters are female. <clears throat> Will we allow men to be a part of it if they wanted to play women? So it's possible to do that. Uh, and then you have the demands on sign-up, like you have with Delirium. Since people were signing up <coughs> as couples, you solved the gender issue by that. Uh, 
but you can have a dilemma with some of these gender issues. For instance, uh, the have every all the characters being played by people of all genders. <coughs> it's like is your and here we are into the culture thing that we were talking about. Are your players uh, comfortable with this? Are they comfortable with all characters being bisexual, which is the case in Screwing the Crew? Or people playing a different gender than their own, having drag kings and drag queens in game. If you are from a culture where this is not okay, then maybe you shouldn't decide that way. Or maybe you should challenge it. But that's up to you. You can see this. Uh, transparency. Someone was talking about uh, you have. If your game is about big secrets, maybe it's not that good to rerun it. Uh, so it could be good to have transparency or semi-transparency to aim for that. Of course, if you're going to make the, if you're if you're designing a game that's designed to be played many different places where the car the players won't have contact with each other, it's not that important. But I would go for transparency or semi-transparency. In fact, I would almost always go for transparency or semi-transparency anyhow, but especially with rerunnable games, because it's boring if you, if the game is broken because you, everybody knows the secret. Uh, evaluation is uh, a smart thing to do, to have test runs in the first place. Um, maybe not of a full LARP, this is, this is more from the freeform tradition where you might only have like three players and you only need a room like this to play in, then it's good to do test runs before you write things down. But you could test out methods, for instance, if you're going to do the workshop, text, test out methods. Does this work? Uh, you can test out some things. Or if you can test the whole game, it's good. And then evaluate it, and based on the evaluation, change what is not so good. This can be um, important then when you start running the games, especially if you're going to, if, if it's a rerunnable game that your group is making themselves, and that your group is running again and again. You can learn something from every run of the game, make adjustments, change things around. Uh, and it can also be good to have this over time, so that you can see do we get better scores when we change things, or do we have to change them even more? Or is this maybe just something people don't like? Uh, but that you can have this all time. If it's, if it's a rerunnable game that is designed for other people to, to play, it's really funny to get uh, the feedback from people playing it another place. Uh, we wrote uh, the manuscript for Mad About the Boy for the Knut Punkt book last year. And uh, this winter, we suddenly got an email from the Netherlands saying, oh, by the way, we ran your LARP two weeks ago. And here's a blog post to tell how it went. And that was just, hey, this is so cool. Um, so, so it's good to, to say in, uh, that I want feedback on my game. And it's both good if you just want to, to hear how it went, but also if you're planning to do a revision of it. It's good to then have feedback from other people that have run it. And that brings us over to communication. Um, because that's a big challenge, how to communicate your game. How are you going to do that? And the most important thing is that you make the new organizer understand what it is you're trying to do. And to make them able to make their players understand what this is about. That's kind of hard. So sometimes we do it with writing. That's what we usually do. Writing a scenario text, as we call it, uh, which gives the information needed. I just plotted down some of the things that I think should be in there. Can you spell them? Thank you. Um, I'm writing the main idea or synopsis. The synopsis is like the short version of what is this about. Uh, and together with the fact box that makes somebody able to decide if this is something they would like to have more of a look at or not quite quickly. What is, what is it all about? Have that down. 
uh, have a description of what sort of game this is, what genre is it, what, what sort of playing style, what, how do we want this to be played. Uh, of course, description of methods used, and I'm writing intentions because I want people to describe why they are doing different things. Because, for instance, when it's a different culture, and people are, it, it doesn't fit the culture you're in. Then you know what, what is it that the author is intending to do, and maybe you can find a different solution to achieving that goal that fits more with your life culture. Um, game master instructions, uh, so that the person that is going to run it knows what to do. Hello. Uh, and also handouts to players uh, could be something. This is if you don't want to communicate everything uh, verbally on the spot. If you want to make sure that the players get some information. I usually don't like to use this because I think this should be done by the, by the GM. Uh, I believe that this, the information is better when you get it like that. Maybe you could have like a short text, but I've been playing games where you like, as a player, you have to read up like four, five, six pages before you can start playing. And it's important to know that not all players read well. Not everybody gets that much text, and especially if it's a different language. And maybe if it's even using um, large culture language that they are not familiar with. It just takes for granted that they know. So handouts, I'm a bit, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. And of course you need characters or the character creation process. Uh, there are probably other things that could be in it. I also put a walkthrough, uh, which is uh, like, for it could be part of the GM, like the game master instructions. Just how, what are you doing at different points? How much time should you use for what? How are you doing all these things? It's a help so that you don't have to read everything all the time. Uh, it's important if you want somebody to want to play your game and to understand what it's about and being able to give other people this possibility, it needs to be readable. It needs to be easy to, to understand. Uh, have somebody else read it, somebody that's not been a part of creating it, and check if they get what you mean. Make them mark out every sentence they don't understand. Uh, make them, so if you can get help in this process of how to making it more readable, how to lay out uh, so that it's easier to understand what it's all about. This is important. Now there are some things that is very hard to describe in text. And then it could be a good idea to have illustrations, uh, either photos or drawings or something like this. Or maybe you can even make a video instruction uh, and put the link in the manuscript. Put it out on YouTube and have the link in, in the manuscript. Uh, I can go further to LARP style and play style. How do you play things? You need to communicate this. As someone was saying, uh, that is maybe you have like the Nordic style and you have very much how that is. Um, you need to describe this, but you also have to describe what sort of genre that you're going to have. For instance, you could say that it's a Western. But it's more towards Deadwood, so it's more towards nitty gritty, bad people shooting each other, whorehouses and all these things, than Little House on the Prairie. Because that way you make sure that it's that your players and your organizer will understand what sort of LARP is this through using references. Uh, and you can describe what style you want. Now you know, you got to know some of these sliders. Uh, so you can use that sort of language and maybe you then should describe what it's about if you don't think that the people who will read it know what it is. You can say something like 360 degree illusions with intrusive meta techniques. Then you would have to actually describe what this means. Because it could mean different things in different places. Or it could be that the person that's reading it doesn't really know what this is at all. So it's good to 
give examples of what it means. And again, how somebody else read your manuscript, maybe even from another LARP culture. Uh, now you guys know each other, so uh, maybe you can have a Belarusian read it. Does it work? Do you think this is something you could play from this, or is this something you don't understand? Time. Yeah. Um, time frame. This is very short. It would be a good idea to just say how much time do you want to use for different things. And especially to say don't skip the debrief, even if you are taking a six hour LARP, then making it into a four hour LARP at the festival, because that's the, the time frame you can have there. It's important to have the debriefs. Uh, we should probably have done a better debrief after New Voices in Art than what we had time for, but then again, did some things. Some things are better than nothing, but it's better to do it properly. Location. Again, it's important to, to write down what sort of location do you need? What sort of functions do you need at this location? Do you need a kitchen? Uh, or, for instance, do you need somewhere where someone can be dipped into water? Uh, because that's a part of your game. But maybe if you then describe also why you need these things. And say, I need somewhere where you can dip people into this because that's a, an important ritual where they're going through to something else. Maybe they could, uh, if they don't have somewhere to dip people into, water, but they have somewhere where they can bury, bury them in sand, then they can just figure out, okay, then we can do this instead. But it's important to have what sort of functions do you need at this location, so they know what they should look for. Uh, unknown methods is the next point. Uh, you guys have learned some methods this week. Uh, you didn't know them before, some of you knew them. Uh, and if you had picked up just the game from uh, Chamber Games or somewhere else, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily understand what it was unless people described it. So you need to describe your methods and you need to do it with examples so that people understand it. Uh, and also with intentions, as I said. So that if, <clears throat> if it's hard to do it the way we have described, or it's or you find it silly, for that matter. But you know what what are you trying to achieve? So that's uh, good to have. I know that some people disagree with this. For instance, the festival tradition in Denmark, um, <coughs> they think that you shouldn't have intentions, and it should all just come out of the text by itself. Was feedback I got from a game I wrote for them. Uh, I think that's crap. I want intentions, and all the festivalers go, yeah. So that's good. Um, and also limit the amount of methods you're using if you're going to give it to someone else. There was somebody around here that said something about just make it small, make it simple. And that's a good idea, so that you don't have too many things that people need to understand. I want to just show you nordicwiki.org. It's a new a uh, wiki that's been running since April, uh, and it's um, it's a bit hard to see here, but it's a wiki, so people are writing things in continuously. And the thing is, you will probably get in a while, uh, there will be more techniques and methods um, that are described here. And if the description here is good, you can either copy it, or you can just uh, say, go to this page on the Nordic Art Wiki to understand what this is about. So you can use this. And also, if you come up with good stuff that you make, write it into the Wiki. <coughs> because you are learning how to do Nordic LARPs, and you create things as well as anybody else. So if you, if you come up with something, Put it in there. Somebody else can use it. Um, so that's the Nordic Art Wiki. Uh, 
Um, um, yeah, we read the end. So I just want to say that when you are designing, I think your focus should be on flexibility in many ways. So that it's possible to play with different number of people, different genders, different cultures, uh, all these different things. Have, have that in mind. Uh, and when you're communicating, clarity. Make sure that it's possible to read, that it should be readable. Very important. I think I'm missing a slide that I'm sure I made earlier today. <laughs> but, yeah, because, well, but have clarity. Make sure it's readable, have somebody else read it, and, uh, and do something about this. And also, remember to evaluate and change accordingly. Um, especially if you're running your own game several times. Make it better and better and better. Or just make it a bit better, the, the things that needs to be changed. If you don't have the energy to keep doing it better, just look at what is really not working and change that around. Okay, I think that was it. Thank you. We do have uh, a little bit of time for questions, unless you want a break. But if anybody has questions, uh, now. Okay. Maybe you covered it a little bit, but uh, I would also say that one challenge to these kind of readable ARPs are if you need some sort of special cultural background to understand why it's fun at all. Mm. For example, the Lanzarote the game, which yeah. is a game about uh, Norwegians tourists. going to charter tourist trips and getting drunk and doing stupid stuff. And all the characters are very much based on Norwegian stereotypes, and if you're not Norwegian, you won't probably understand the game. Yep. And then that game probably isn't going to be made available outside Norway. Or outside the Nordic countries, maybe. But maybe. That's, that's a limitation. But it's maybe, it's, it's not a reason not to make it, or it could be that people are reading it and they find out that I can take this inspiration, I can use the same methods, but I can write my own characters to just change it around so that it's fun in my culture. Uh, comments on, on markets? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, actually, yeah, culturally specific scenarios for it uh, can yield some interesting discussions when you transpose them, but you have to be aware of it uh, in terms of the time when you transpose. We did a, a scenario about a uh, conflict between uh, different parts in a, uh, in a hospital, uh, which was very specialized for Norway, uh, and did that in Iraq, but had people uh, work with the same conflicts. They, they solved the conflict, but in different uh, manners. Yeah. So you have to uh, work it into the debrief, uh, how things are different in, in different contexts. But I mean, people will read different things into it depending on the context. It doesn't mean you can't do the Nazi water game in Brazil or Russia or whatever. They'll just adapt it to their own context. It's quite interesting, actually. Mm. It is. Pavel, did you have the same one? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, come talk to me if, uh, if you are wondering about other things. There are also several other of the instructors that have made rerunable games. <coughs> so many of us know, uh, know more about this. And also, uh, I really want to learn more about it. And uh, so your questions can teach me more about how to do this. So don't hesitate with coming and asking.